Hey everyone, hi everyone and coach and Hoke Athletes, H. Hande here with another training talk. Yes, I know it's been a while, we've got some new changes. We're in a new place, more on that later. Uh, but we're going to dive in with how hard is high altitude training. And we're going to break down some of the science, maybe some of the benefits, but also drawbacks of high altitude training. And I, I do realize that most of you probably don't live as high as I do, at least. I'm at 7,500 feet, 2,200 meters about uh, here outside of Salida, Colorado, which is pretty high even for Colorado. But, uh, you know, a lot of you, if you live in a major city, probably closer to sea level, maybe you're at moderate altitude, uh, even in places I've been into in Europe or, in, you know, different areas in the mountains, uh, there's not a real high plateau. Colorado is kind of a unique place in the world. I know there are people out there, I've been to Nepal and other countries, uh, big mountains in China as well, but uh, I digress. Let's break it down. High altitude training, how hard really is it? What makes the difference? So the first thing to realize with altitude training, and I'll pull up a little gradient uh, I've got going on over here actually, is that it's not so much about uh, that there's less oxygen it's that as you go up higher in elevation, uh, away from sea level, the air is less dense. There's less pressure um, uh, pushing the oxygen molecules closer together, so to speak. So at sea level, everything's great. You got oxygen molecules pretty close. This one's, uh, I'll cite this website, but uh, basic thing, maybe 21% uh, oxygen. You know, this is, we're talking about the atmosphere. So the weight of the atmosphere, uh, changes as you go up. So, you know, at sea level, we're up, you know, 21, 20.9% oxygen molecules are close together. Now, we start going up in altitude. Let's say we're up at 5,000 feet, uh, maybe, you know, 5,200 feet, boulder elevation, right? We call it the mile high city because it's 5,200 feet, 1,600 meters in elevation, where I lived a good deal in Colorado. A lot of Colorado is around that altitude, actually. It's hard to get lower than that, and I'll explain why that's a double-edged sword later and why uh, that creates some problems, but you up to 5,000 feet, uh, and all of a sudden we're down to 17.3%. The oxygen molecules are spread farther apart. There's less air pressure uh, keeping things dense, right? So you're gonna feel that. And when I first moved to Colorado from sea level, I trained most of my first 26 years of life near sea level uh, in Oregon, Michigan, upstate New York, you name it. Uh, when I first moved to Colorado, very rough adjustment. If you've ever traveled up to the mountains at altitude, uh, you, and you start running, your tempo paces are off, your VO2 max paces are off, even your easy day pace, you're huffing and puffing, and it's quite a bit harder, and that's the reason why. Now, what people don't know is as we get up even higher, it's not a linear scale, right? Things kind of get real hard real quick. So where I live now, we're over 75, about 7,500 feet almost, uh, 2,200 meters, I believe that is. And, you know, if looking at this chart, <clears throat> maybe 15.5% oxygen, that's quite a bit of a drop, uh, even from even from Boulder, Denver altitude. So the difference from going from sea level to 5,000 feet or you know sea level to 1,600 meters about, 1,500 meters, is almost, it's almost just as hard then to go from, from that altitude at 5,000 feet up to 7,500 feet or where I am now. So, you know, for me, it's a rude awakening, uh, even moving from Boulder, up here to run, you're running quite a bit slower and you never really get used to that. Um, it's, it's really hard in the first couple of weeks, obviously, the body kind of starts to try to adjust and we'll talk about those adaptations, but uh, generally it's, it's, you're always slower and there's even NCAA conversion charts for the 10K and you know, it depends on a lot of individual characteristics with your genetics, how you respond, how you might not respond, you know, what your iron levels are maybe, how you train exactly, um, but also were you born and raised at altitude? We see athletes from, well, Colorado here, but even, you know, East Africa, they train and they're born and raised at, at altitude. They tend to always be a lot better and they're pretty fast even at high altitude, almost as fast as they are at sea level in some cases, whereas people like me, maybe you have a lower VO2 max, you came from sea level, uh, the conversions may be a little, a lot bigger. So just to throw out some of my pace conversions of how hard it is, and you know, again, this is after I lived in Boulder for years and years and years and trained there, I'm still 10 to 12 seconds a mile slow around my marathon pace. Uh, to you know lactate threshold <clears throat> even vo2 max pace uh, I wouldn't notice it so much on easy days 
but I notice it on those higher quality days. And 10 seconds a mile, 12 seconds a mile, it's the difference between me like barely doing threshold two mile repeats, 3K repeats, barely running marathon pace in Boulder, and then realizing I could go to sea level and almost hold that same pace uh, for the full marathon distance. Or, you know, I'm going, you go to sea level and all of a sudden you're running the same pace at a lower heart rate and a lower breathing rate. It's not necessarily, it doesn't feel easier on your legs though. More on that later. Whereas, you know, I move up here to outside of Salida up a lot higher. We could be talking about 20 seconds to 25 seconds a mile for some of these workouts. And you know, it's, it's a lot harder. So it's, it's very devastating when you realize you're trying to go to the track to do VO2 max workouts, speed workouts, and you're barely running marathon pace. And it's supposed to be more like 5k, 10k pace, right? So that kind of difference, 20 to 25 seconds a mile, uh, what is that, like 15, 18 seconds a kilometer, uh, pretty significant. Now, of course, the benefits of high altitude training, and you know, I, like I said, there's individual variations, how people respond, what the physiological adaptations are. Instantly, your body kind of goes into shock first couple days at altitude. Let's say you come out here from sea level, you're going to do Leadville. Uh, people want to come out to do Leadville early. Now, Leadville's up at 10,000 feet. That's a lot higher than where I am now. And that's, you know, 10,000, 12,000 feet in Colorado. We consider that the death zone uh, when you're running. It gets real hard to run uphill in the mountains, especially if it's a technical steep trail. When you get above, you know, 10, 12,000 feet, and of course, if you've run any of our peaks, we have 56 peaks over 14,000 feet, 4,300 meters. Uh, you know, it's it's very very hard to run unless you're acclimated. And altitude training definitely helps for super high altitude races like that. Being born and raised at altitude, training at altitude, Pikes Peak, for example, uh, a couple races I've done, uh, Golden Trail Series in Nepal, we got up pretty high as well. But uh, otherwise, it's a double-edged sword. So. Come in for Leadville, 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. Uh, people feel sick. You get a headache. You're dehydrated. You're you you can't sleep at night. The part of it's the the our really dry climate too. You're parched. You're you're peeing at different times. You don't know if you're overhydrated, underhydrated. Getting dehydrated early. You, you burn through your glycogen stores faster. All sorts of these metabolic changes too. Uh, Honestly, it's going to take several weeks to feel a little better and actually have some real adaptations. Generally, people feel the worse after like two or three or four days at altitude. Uh, so, you know, some considerations when people do altitude camps and they've done studies with a lot of elites, especially uh, where you want to be training at altitude for at least like three or four weeks to really get some benefits, some changes in your blood profile. Mainly, uh, I mean, you're getting changes in blood volume, plasma volume, but uh, your body's natural EPO uh, starts kicking in to trigger to make more red blood cells. And you could actually get um, bigger red blood cells, uh, more hemoglobin on uh, the red blood cells, and basically better oxygen carrying capacity. The hematocrit percent also goes up. And, you know, for someone like me, that wasn't really the whole th reason why I want to do high altitude training or I moved. Uh, to super high altitude. I did want to experiment with high altitude training coming from sea level, running at Hanson's near sea level in Michigan. But I realized it's a double-edged sword and uh, there's a lot of trade-offs with it. It's the main reason I wanted to be uh, in Colorado was just for the mountain trails. And it just so happens in Colorado, you can't really go low. You're always over like 4,000 feet, 5,000 feet. And if you're in the big mountains where I am in the middle of the state, uh, you're over that 7,000 feet, 2,000 meter type of scenario. And it's not ideal. I'm going to say it. It's not ideal. It's great if you're training for Pikes Peak or high altitude race, but it's a double-edged sword because it could hurt your recovery. Uh, me recovering from my pulmonary embolism <laughs> that I got in Boulder and then moving up higher, probably not the best thing. I already had enough trouble breathing. I should have been in a more oxygen rich environment at sea level. Uh, I don't want my blood to get super thick necessarily. My hematocrit could get close to 50 up here. Easy, easy. And it, you know, pulls your iron stores. So it's very demanding to train and always be at altitude. If you're doing high intensity, high volume, uh, grinding it out, it's, you know, the body does not <laughs> recover well uh, when it's deprived of oxygen, right? Um, and the benefits, I'd say, you know, it's a real double-edged sword. The other thing is, if you're training for faster races, even some ultra marathons, you want that leg turnover, you want that power, 
And you can't get that power when you're doing any sort of hill reps or high intensity intervals or even tempo runs, high quality long runs, uh, you're just not gonna be running as fast up here. And yes, the air density is lower, so theoretically you could sprint faster. You know, for cyclists and, and, and sprinters, you know, there is less drag with the air density, but that doesn't really matter uh, for us distance runners, especially even if we're only moving at 10 miles an hour, six minute mile pace, uh, four minutes per kilometer, uh, even a little faster than that, it's very marginal with the air density change. So, you know, if you're losing that musculature power in your stride, you're not used to running 5K pace because you can't run 5K pace uh, up here, then you go down to sea level for a race and boom, all of a sudden, yeah, you could run, you could breathe uh, easier and your heart rate's the, the lower at the same pace, but to go a notch faster, your legs are screaming at you because your musculature wasn't ready for that developing that power and that turnover. So, you know, a lot of elites train at altitude and we don't really have access to lower altitude, especially in Colorado here. And that does make things tough. Uh, in an ideal world, looking at the science, and I've pulled up a lot of studies over the years, the whole idea of sleeping high and training low, or at least being able to travel around to different regions of the country at different times or different regions of the state and be up high, be at low for different weeks, is really the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, if you were serious full-time professional 10K, 5K runner, marathon runner, even some ultra marathon runners, that kind of change is really ideal. And it's why, you know, in, in Oregon, they had this, in Portland, Oregon, they had this altitude house where, uh, you know, guys like Galen Rupp and stuff were living at a pressurized house and they were at like 12,000 feet. What is that, like 35, 3,600 meters? And they'd stay like up there at like 16 hours a day. They'd sleep at this high altitude. You could have an, an altitude tent as well, but they're also playing video games, spending 16 hours a day at super high altitude. Boom, they go outside the pressurized house. They're down at sea level. They're running track workouts on the campus uh, around Beaverton and they can develop that power. So, you know, you could rotate it where you're going back and forth doing altitude stints, altitude camps. A lot of elites, you know, if I was at sea level, I would probably would have invested in an altitude tent. Seems a little silly up here in Colorado. Uh, I'd rather be able to get down to sea level fast and do some targeted speed workouts though. So that's really the double-edged sword with altitude training and what makes things so much harder. The other consideration, of course, with altitude training, uh, if you come up and you do a stint at altitude, you're huff huffing and puffing, you're kind of like hyperventilating, gets really hard. Uh, when I go out and do high intensity workouts or, you know, especially going uphill, you instantly could cross over your thresholds really quick. And it's almost this hyperventilating pant where you just feel like you're drowning and not getting enough oxygen, right? It's really painful. It's really hard. Uh, trust me, I've lived up here for years now. You never get used to it. You get better at it, but you're still not as fast as you would be at sea level. Um, and then, you know, if I go down and do a race all of a sudden at sea level, or even something at a more moderate altitude, like Chamonix is around 4,000 feet only, during UTMB, you really don't get up that high. I know it's like 8,000 feet, um, you know, a little over 2,000 meters, but it's not nothing extreme that a fit athlete, even from sea level, can't tackle because of their fitness is so good. And a lot of those athletes that do well in these mountain ultras uh, train at some moderate elevations, maybe uh, in different mountain ranges in Europe or, or Asia. So um, I digress there a bit, but you carry over that breathing pattern down to sea level. So I'm hyperventilating a bit up here, breathing kind of shallow, and then you go to sea level, you kind of keep that pattern even though you have a lot more density of oxygen molecules around you. And that could be kind of a, a tough thing too. It's like your body's kind of trying to figure out what the heck's going on. All of a sudden I flew somewhere and I'm doing a marathon and it's at sea level and I, I don't know how to respond to that. So, you know, we do shorter intervals up here. We have longer recovery periods sometimes. We realize Power is, you know, the name of the game, power and speed, especially if you're running fast and trying to reach your potential. But a lot of the aerobic base work is great to develop at altitude. Don't get me wrong. You have lower impact force when you're running slower anyway. But like I said, the recovery with the sleep, draining your iron stores, your body always on high alert, trying to get that oxygen, it does make it very demanding. And so that's why in a, in a perfect world, we would be cycling uh, these high altitude stints. And even when I was in Boulder, I felt like it wasn't really high enough. It was high enough to slow me down a lot, but it wasn't high enough to get 
super high altitude benefits. So I would go up to 12,000 feet up above Nederland, uh, you know, Rollinsville, some of the mountains in the Indian peaks there around Estes Park, Rocky Mountain National Park, and train on the trails a lot. Even the peaks surrounding Boulder go up to over 8,000 feet. So pretty beneficial there. But like I said, altitude is a double-edged sword. It's a give and take, and it's something that if you're racing at high altitude, it's definitely worth really investing in and, and focusing on. But, you know, I knew guys that have done well at, at Pikes Peak who come from Europe closer to sea level, and they're just super fit so they could cope with altitude better, or they use an oxygen, uh, a real oxygen mask, not one of those fake straw masks where it's harder to breathe, but like you have to have it hooked up to an altitude simulator, uh, much like an altitude tent type of generator where it's, it's or actually in that, those cases, they work differently, but I digress there. Thanks so much for following along with this uh, training talk Tuesday. Uh, more comment below with future training talk topics that you would like to hear about on uh, the top voted one, I'll answer in the next talk. Again, check out my extensive playlist. I've been doing these videos for over 12 years here on YouTube. Uh, any service, any distance, I've run the 5K, I've run the marathon, I've run ultra marathons, technical mountains, you name it, flatter stuff. Um, but yeah, comment below with that, get the topics going. Make sure it's not a topic I've covered already though in some of those playlist training talks. And uh, again, I got some blog updates, exciting announcements, my last event for this year, competitive event, race, uh, I will announce very soon as well as a tour of the new place, some of the progress I've been uh, making to try to change things up, stay healthy and finish off the year strong. But I'll give you a hint, my last event, uh, you know I like to do any surface, any distance. So uh, stay tuned for that. Hope your training's going well. Thanks to all the Patreon supporters for really making this channel possible, as well as title sponsor Hoka. Keeping the dream alive, more media coming your way. Check out our training plans for any service, any distance at higherrunning.com. Subscribe to Sandy's channel as well. Thanks so much. Like and subscribe this video if you like it. And stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions.